Friends, uh, now uh, a highlight um, of the summit, the opening plenary, uh, talking about um, India's growth, Greek joining India in the way forward, and uh, together uh, making the world a better place to, to live on uh, in a very strategic partnership. And uh, please take your seat, and uh, I'm very glad to hand over to a dear friend of mine, uh, Branchal Sharma, who is uh, moderating this panel in the presence of the minister. So, Brancha, please um, go ahead. He's a very um, uh, experienced um, intellectual, I would say a public intellectual, um, used to work for Bloomberg as the India representative, and uh, now is engaging with think tanks and governments all around the world. Brancha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, it's a real privilege to be here in Athens after many years. I think we are at a very interesting inflection point of relationship between India and Greece. We've had uh, several decades of relationship, but the recent years, what we have seen in the growth and development of India is, is really remarkable because today, if you look at it, we see a lot of uncertainty, conflict across the world in various regions and in regions which we thought were very stable. But India, in the last few years, has seen political stability and economic continuity, which is unprecedented in many other parts uh, of the world. And many of you would know that 2024 has been the year of elections. Uh, more than 50 countries have gone to elections, and some are uh, going to complete it by end of uh, this calendar year. But what is fascinating is that India's election, which is the largest democratic exercise in the world, has concluded. And we have a government which is, for the historic uh, moment, a third term, which has happened after, uh, after several decades, which means that we have economic continuity, we have political stability. And India has, at a geopolitical level and a geoeconomic level, carved a very clear position for itself. Uh, Minister has been to India, our Prime Minister has been here, but I think the focus on infrastructure has been tremendous, and the billions of dollars of investment in, in basic infrastructure, in logistics, is beginning to show a lot of impact. And it is here that India and Greece have the opportunity of working together in a new dimension, if you look at uh, the logistics sector, if you look at value chain, if you look at shipping, uh, new industrial trails, I think the, the natural connection between India and Greece has to be built on in an accelerated way. So with this, I'm going to invite uh, a minister to share a few words about his views on where India and Greece can take it forward, because we look at uh, a lot of uh, constructive ideas, and then with the business leaders here, I'll request them for their opening statement, and then take as many questions from you as possible. Honorable Minister, over to you. Thank you so much. Dear guests, dear presidents and members of the Indian and Greek business associations, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who traveled from India, welcome to Athens. I am pleased and honored to take part in the 16th Arasis India meeting. Congratulations on your diligent efforts in organizing this event. It is truly motivating to witness governmental officials, industry experts, and innovative entrepreneurs from Greece and India joining forces to share valuable insights and seek opportunities for collaboration on mutually beneficial projects. Our nations share a rich history of friendship and collaboration. In August 23, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Athens, providing us with the opportunity to enhance our relationship to a strategic level. Subsequently, our Prime Minister Kiriakos Mitsotakis visited India in February 2024, and I was honored to be present both in the visit of the Indian Prime Minister to Athens and the Greek Prime Minister to India. During his visit, I led a 63-member business delegation comprising 
distinguished Greek companies and institutions to South, South Delhi, Mumbai, and Bangalore. In these cities, Greek Indian business conferences were organized, productive G2G meetings did take place, and numerous business-to-business -business meetings between Greek and Indian companies were held. Additionally, six memoranda of cooperation were signed between Greek and Indian entities. The broad and diverse business mission provided us with a chance to improve collaboration across important economic sectors of mutual interest, including information technology, health sciences, energy, construction, shipping, audiovisual production, agri-food, supply chain, real estate, and tourism. It enabled us to capitalize on the distinct advantages of our countries for mutual benefit, while also addressing the impact of the climate crisis and promoting sustainable development. Over the past five years, Greece has established itself as a dependable business partner. Under the leadership of our Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the government has ensured political stability and is driven the country's transition towards an export-driven, investment-friendly, competitive and globally-oriented company. Through carefully planned and strategic initiatives, we are actively shaping Greece's future as a reliable hub for energy, logistics and trade, leveraging its pivotal geopolitical position in the South and Mediterranean at the crossroads of three continents. In the rapidly evolving energy sector, it is no secret that Greece is progressively establishing itself as an entry point for gas imports in Europe. Major energy corridors are being designed and built, both on land and at sea. These initiatives align with the objectives of the European Union, which aim to address current geopolitical challenges and promote the diversification of sources, routes and supplies. With the substantial progress achieved, we are keen to explore opportunities to enhance partnerships aiming to connect Asia, Africa, and Europe. Furthermore, Greece is striving to become a hub for transmitting green electricity generated from RES in Egypt and the Middle East to the Western Balkans and Europe. In 2022, Greece ranked seventh globally in the utilization of renewable energy sources in its energy mix and is on track to meet the national target of producing 80% of electricity from RES by 2027. The swift advancement in the integration of renewables and the gradual incorporation of energy storage into the electrical system present numerous investment opportunities. Green investments are expected to exceed 44 billion euro by 2030 through the implementation of 21 actions of the National Recovery and Resilience Fund. In addition to being a producer and exporter of green electricity generated from RES, Greece aims to become a major logistics hub in Southeastern Europe, which is of particular interest to the industrial sector of India. To achieve this goal, we're in the process of building a railway network that will link major ports in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. This endeavor will elevate these ports into crucial hubs, offering comprehensive transportation, logistics, and supply chain services. Aligned with EU objectives, we are fully supportive of investments and partnerships in the transport and logistics industry along the commercial axis from south to north and from east to west. The G20 announcement regarding the trade corridor connecting Europe with the Middle East and India through shipping ports and rail routes described by President Biden as a game-changing investment, offers significant partnership prospects. I want to reaffirm our commitment to fully support this ambitious project, which is currently on hold due to the situation in the Middle East. Greece has the potential to act as India's gateway to Europe, with Greek ports serving as the IMEC hub. Greece's geostrategic location offers abundant business opportunities, establishing our country as a vital trade gateway to the growing markets in Southeastern Europe, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Black Sea. The bilateral trade between Greece and India 
has evolved steadily over time. In 2023, its volume exceeded 1 billion euro, yet there is untapped potential for growth, particularly in sectors such as food and beverage, energy and renewables, IT and telecommunications, logistics and tourism. Furthermore, as both of our nations are maritime countries, I believe we all recognize the significance of strengthening our economic cooperation, particularly in the maritime and blue economy sectors. To achieve the balance between nature and economy, the European Union has adopted a new approach for a sustainable blue economy that will contribute to the mitigation of climate change, the enhancement of circular economy, and the preservation of biodiversity and landscapes. This new approach includes all industries and sectors associated with oceans, seas <coughs> and coasts. It promotes coexistence and forces collaboration in the maritime domain while prioritizing environmental preservation. This strategy creates 4.5 million direct jobs and generates over 650 billion euro in turnover. It also emphasizes the importance of investing in research, skills and innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, the successful development of sustainable projects relies on synergies and investments. However, for partnerships to flourish, it is crucial to create a secure and stable environment, demonstrate goodwill and exhibit resilience. I strongly believe that our countries are heading in the right direction. There are opportunities available for exploration. I'm certain that you will find suitable partners and with mutual trust, respect and understanding, we can establish beneficial win-win and highly profitable ventures. As Mahatma Gandhi said, the future depends on what we do today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Minister, you very rightly said, I think the next phase of growth has to focus on people and the planet. We cannot also think about growing without taking care of environmental concerns. And, and you mentioned the maritime <coughs> opportunities, and I'm sure many of you know India is embarking on a huge global mega port cluster construction program for the next 20 years, which, which will not just revitalize India's uh, shipping and logistics uh, and value chain industry, but also create tremendous opportunities for, uh, for companies in Europe and Greece. But there is much that India can learn from your deep expertise in this sector, Minister. So we'll explore these ideas. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Rajiv Call to share his views. Uh, uh, Mr. Call has been the chairman of leading industry bodies in India, himself a very respected industry leader. Uh, Rajiv, may I request you to share your thoughts on how India and Greece uh, can work together for the next few years? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, a pleasure. And uh, I'm delighted to be uh, amidst all of you. Uh, and Mr. Minister, thank you for your opening remarks. Uh, it's laid, I think, a very good foundation for today's session. Well, you know, our plenary is titled India Blossoms, but really we should say how India blossoms and how Greece, which is now going through a str strong revival process after the earlier crisis, how we can work together. How can really, we blossom together? How do we blossom <laughs> together, yeah. Well, India's uh, blossoming story uh, is, is not just uh, something which has begun. It began, uh, you know, many years ago, about 30 years ago, and we've been growing, uh, climbing up the ladder uh, steadily but surely. I mean, just to give you a, a perspective, uh, in 1980, India was the 12th largest economy in the world. Ten years later, in 1990, we were 11th largest in the world. In 2000, we were the 7th largest in the world. In 2010, we were the 6th largest in the world. And, of course, in 2020, we were the fifth largest in the world. And in 2025, I think uh, we will definitely be the fourth largest because, uh, unfortunately, the economy of Japan is not doing extremely well. And our growth rates will make sure that we kind of overtake uh, the Japanese economy in the very, very near future. And probably by 2028 20, or 2030, 
we will overtake uh, the economy uh, to become the, third, the, the German economy to become the third largest. But I think we must keep in perspective that this is not true in per capita. India is still a poor country. We have 1.4 billion people. Out of the 1.4 billion people, uh, only about 10 million are, are very rich. Uh, about uh, 100, 100 million are uh, on the, uh, what should I say, uh, on the above middle average income group. About another 200 are in the average. And the balance are sort of all what we call the aspirational society. And India is uh, getting about 20 million people out from the uh, lower middle class to the upper middle class. So we are, we are growing in the right direction. And it's this young momentum. We have a, uh, what they call the demographic dividend because we are a very, very young population. And our workforce will remain young for the next 20 years. So we are going to grow. Now, coming to where we can collaborate together, clearly there are many uh, leadership uh, areas that Greece has. I mean, traditionally, I think, where it's shipbuilding, maritime, ports, you always have had uh, tremendous knowledge. And now uh, you are getting a lot of robotics into your shipbuilding. And I think that is something which is uh, pretty much a trendsetter globally. And this is something where India can learn. Uh, our Prime Minister has, for the last uh, many years, been uh, developing the, the uh, coastal area through many ports, large, medium, and small, because India has a huge amount of seafront, huge amount. And uh, so the idea is to integrate that together into a thing called Sagar Mala, which is an Indian term for getting a good uh, linkage uh, for connectivity for within India and across the world. So this is uh, one area which is there. The other area is, uh, I mean, India has today the third largest ecosystem in startups. Right? Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, the <coughs> US has about a thousand unicorns, uh, China has about 170, and India has over 110. So, in terms of the new startups, India is doing extremely well. The, it's supported by the government, but primarily driven by the young people who are coming out of management schools, engineering colleges. And this is actually a very strong and new growth engine for India in terms of GDP, in terms of employment. <clears throat> and uh, the world over is focusing in India in funding this growth. Now, similarly, in a few niche areas, Greece has a lot of strength. If you talk of artificial intelligence, Greece is doing extremely well. If you're ta talking of data systems and data and analytics, Greek Greece is doing quite well. And also, if you talk on networking of systems, Greece is doing well. So is India. So there's huge amount of collaboration that is possible and inherent in these high-tech areas. And uh, I think we need to perhaps uh, try and deliberate in some of the brainstorming sessions which take place in the boardroom sessions as to how we can work together to sort of get all this going. But let me pause now because I know uh, we have a time limit, so let me contribute uh, 30 seconds of my time back to you, uh, Pranjal. Thank you. Rajiv is always generous with his time. So 30 seconds extra is always welcome. Uh, Rajiv, you forgot uh, one very interesting thing, Greek food. We haven't discussed Greek food yet. So we would love to have some more, uh, you know, Greek olives and oil and other uh, cheeses into India as well, because, you know, uh, we, we really enjoy your cuisine. There are so many uh, commonalities to it. But we'll come to finance now uh, with uh, 
uh, chief executive of uh, Eurobank uh, in, in Greece, because one of the things that we have to talk about is how is all this going to be uh, financed? And the money is, is what greases the world's uh, economy. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Foykun uh, Karavias, he's the chief executive of Eurobank. And uh, you were telling us earlier that you already have a plan to expand in India, but we'd love to hear your opening remarks. Sure. Uh, Pazan, th thank you very much for that. I'm really glad to participate in this panel about uh, the growth economy of India and how Europe and uh, Greece in particular could become an effective partner in this journey. And I think uh, Rajiv gave us a few nice examples of how Greece and India could um, work together. I would like to elaborate and add further uh, to what Rajiv uh, said with a few more ideas around networks and uh, networks for the flow of goods, networks for the flow of data, uh, but also networks for the, the corporate flows. And I think each of them could be a separate chapter in the potential future uh, relationship of uh, Greece with India. So, number one is the flow of goods, and uh, I think here we have a blueprint, which is the IMEC, the India Middle East uh, Europe Corridor, um, Greece is in one side of uh, this corridor. It could add a lot of value because of its ports. It is not only Piraeus ports, but the port of Salonika, Alexandrupolis, Volos, and um, th th there is also the logistics infrastructure that the minister uh, described very nicely. Uh, there is um, a long pipeline of investments in this area and definitely Greece can be part of IMEC and add a lot of uh, value. But nowadays, besides the flow of goods, maybe the flow of data is becoming even more important. And um, there is this plan uh, in parallel to IMEC to have a cable for the flow of uh, data all the way from Singapore to India, to Middle East, Israel, and then to Med. This is the EMC, the East to Med uh, corridor. Uh, all the way to Marseille. All the way to Marseille, South France. To Marseille. Uh, that's, that's correct, uh, Mr. Fragoyanis. Um, so it has two branches, the West and the East. The West is already uh, under construction. A Greek company, the Public Power Corporation, PPC, uh, participates on this joint venture with 20-25% and connects the MED with Saudi Arabia. There are already discussions about uh, building the east part of this uh, cable, and it would be nice if major Indian companies in the area of energy or telecoms uh, join this uh, venture. Now, the same way that logistics are important next to the ports, data centers are very important next to such uh, data corridors uh, to, to cables. And data centers is another sector of the Greek economy that shows quite uh, growth uh, over uh, the last few years, but also there is uh, potential for future growth. Uh, we had the American company Digital Reality uh, acquiring the major Greek um, data centers company, Lambda Helix. Microsoft is building uh, three data centers in Greece, and there are discussions about the so-called mega data centers in Greece uh, with uh, capacity of 500 to 1,000 megawatts. And because also uh, Greece is quite advanced in terms of um, RES, uh, it can really uh, provide electricity from renewables for the operation of these data centers. And then there is the third pillar on this network uh, vision, which is the corporate flow. Um, there is a lot of opportunity, obviously, in India, but I think Indian companies have already started looking in doing business outside India, and in particular in, the, uh, in Europe. And uh, obviously, in order to do this step, they have to, to establish a holding company in one of the EU countries. Uh, obviously, they should feel welcome in uh, such a country, and also they need to have local partners, especially in the financial sector. And Eurobank is working uh, quite actively in building this infrastructure, 
to, create, to create the financial service basis for Indian uh, businesses. So in that respect, uh, Greece and Cyprus, and I will explain why uh, Cyprus as well, could become gateways of Indian uh, corporates uh, to do business in the EU. Especially Cyprus is uniquely placed to welcome Indian companies. I would say that Cyprus has the entire package an Indian company would require for its EU presence, especially after the UK's exit from the Union. Let me mention uh, a few of these advantages, then I will close with that. First of all, Cyprus is a common law jurisdiction, actually the only EU country with common law, uh, part of the Commonwealth, so a common point with uh, India, as well as a member of the EU. It has a rich ecosystem of professional services, including legal, tax and accounting uh, expertise, and a long tradition of welcoming foreign companies that want to do business in the EU. Business language is English, the same as in India, with a large number of professionals that are UK educated. The double taxation treaty between Cyprus and India is very strong, and actually uh, Cyprus has one of the most attractive regimes, uh, tax regimes in, uh, in, uh, Euro in uh, Europe. The financial system is tuned in servicing businesses and the uh, Eurobank has a very strong footprint there. And last but not least, the geographical proximity uh, both to India and also to Middle East makes, makes it, makes Cyprus a prime spot for the first EU step of an Indian company. So, uh, definitely, uh, Greece and Cyprus have uh, the advantage of becoming um, uh, gateways for Indian companies to Europe. Eurobank is working on that. Uh, it was mentioned before that we are establishing a permanent uh, base in Mumbai through a rep office, and we are teaming up with all the major Indian chambers to promote this idea. Thank you. Thank you. For, I think you said it very well in terms of the various uh, networks. Uh, and I think very interestingly, the connectivity uh, with data centers becomes very critical. And you use the magic word of tax. You know, uh, for all businesses, if you have a low tax regime and a favorable tax regime, uh, money immediately flows in the direction wherever the taxes uh, are favorable. So uh, I, we will elaborate a little bit more on this uh, later, but uh, let me invite uh, Vineet Agarwal, uh, Managing Director of Transport Corporation of India, to share his thoughts. Vineet, uh, this is also very interesting geopolitical times that we live in. Um, so if we look at uh, value chain related issues, uh, there has been a lot of dimensions of change. But um, I, would, I would like you to share your thoughts from your perspective on the opportunities you see both for Indians coming to Greece and Greeks coming to India. Uh, I'll take a step back, I'll say, this is really the time for India. Uh, we are at the cusp of really massive economic changes and social changes. Uh, the aspirations of our people today cannot be stopped by whims of politicians. Gone are those days. Everyone wants growth. Everybody wants development. But we should also remember this is a one-time, lifetime opportunity for India not to mess it up. We have, like many other countries, lots of problems. We have problems of inclusivity between rural and urban areas, uh, between religion, inclusivity issues. We have problems of disparity between incomes. We have problems of employability, not enough jobs. We have problems of the formalization of the economy, as well as the financialization of the economy. But all of these problems are being addressed. And in the 25, 30 years that I've been working, uh, I have seen the last 10, 15 years of dramatic change. So anecdotally, yesterday when I was coming from the airport to, to the city, I was just talking to the taxi driver. And I asked him, I'm from India, what do you think about India? Oh, it's a dangerous country. I said, why do you think it's dangerous? Too spicy food. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he said, he, he said that, um, it's because there are so many poor people. Uh, so I said, yes, there are poor people. What else? 
So we don't know whether we'll be able to go anywhere. I mean, is there enough infrastructure? Look at this road. I mean, it's a beautiful road from the airport to the city in Athens. I said, India is, and I didn't tell him, but I said, yes, you should come to India. He said, I need a friend. I said, you're my friend. Come, no problem. Uh, but India is investing 3.5% of its GDP every year into infrastructure. It's massive. I mean, I'm in the logistics sector, and I know the kind of work that is happening in this uh, space. And uh, infrastructure has a triple, trickle-down effect. It has a 3x, 4x kind of multiplier effect. It's not what many countries did was just give out money to the poor or give out money. India does some of that as well. But the investment into infrastructure is going down to many, many industries. It is having a direct impact. The investment that's going into other areas, and infrastructure has, of course, the linkages to logistics. It has linkages to whatever's happening on, say, the railways. Um, ra uh, infrastructure has importance on the port side, and as well as on the city side, the urbanization issues. We have uh, metro projects that are coming up that are massive. So this basically creates an opportunity for any kind of company that is coming to India, any kind. You can, uh, from, I, yeah, today I heard somewhere that a large percentage of companies in Greece are SMEs. We need that ecosystem connect between SMEs of India and SMEs of Greece. That's where the learning will come. One area I'm not going to talk about what has already been discussed is tourism. I think both countries, both Greece and India, have their soft power. Everyone knows, everyone loves Greek food. Everyone loves Indian food also, even if it's spicy. Um, and you, you count me in. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, the soft power when it comes to food, the soft power when it comes to people to people connect, the soft power when it comes to things like tourism are massive. And I think we need to leverage that to, to the maximum extent between the two nations. Uh, I will not get into specifically to geopolitics yet, but uh, this is just, and, and other than that, of course, food, food processing, seafood processing, lots of areas are there where I think Greece and India can really cooperate. India is at the process of creating, is letting, is, is wanting its voice to be heard. And the voice to be heard is happening. We are not in the G7. We're not part of the National Security Council, the Global Security Council, UN Security Council. And that's why India is trying very hard that we create our own axis of power. When it comes to the military side, we have the, uh, I think, the I2U2. Uh, on the economic side, various FTAs, the FTAs that are happening. On the political side, we have the, uh, uh, the Quad as well. That's both military and economic and political. So like this, some of these things are happening. And of course, what the Honorable Minister mentioned about the India Middle East Europe corridor. Once that gets activated, the voice of India will be heard. So you cannot, as Greek uh, businessmen, avoid and miss India. Thank you, Vinny. That, that's uh, very well said. Uh, I think the other thing that we have in common, there was a very famous movie called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Yeah. Minister. <laughs> and I can tell you there, there should be another movie on My Big Fat Indian Wedding as well. So uh, Vineet and uh, Minister and all of us were talking earlier about wedding industry itself is a fantastic opportunity for both countries. You know, uh, we should have Greek weddings in India and Indian weddings in, in Greece. So that would be one good way to connect uh, people as well. Uh, Minister, there was a great reference to, to the uh, connectivity of uh, telecom fiber line, uh, which uh, Faikon referred to. But another very important dimension is air connectivity uh, for people to be able to travel to each other. Uh, in your visits to India and, and uh, the bilateral conversations, what kind of elements of improved connectivity are you uh, seeing which will roll out in the next few months? Well, I have been to India so many times, especially prior to joining the government. I've traveled all around the country, and I can feel I have a strong sense of the people-to-people -people connection and the uh, understanding of the two peoples in so many ways, historical, uh, cultural, Bollywood, fat weddings <laughs> that last for a long time. Uh, so connectivity is truly important. As tourism is important to Greece and tourism is important to India, 
it is very important that we get connected with direct flight. So this is within uh, our reach of uh, uh, materializing this plan by 2025-2026 and I am hopeful that we will see direct flights taking place. The other thing that we need to progress on and become more efficient at is granting and issuing visas for a visit to Greece in, within a reasonable period of time. So this is something that we are looking at. And I also think that it is very important to start looking into the potential opportunities for joint ventures and working together, not only in the traditional sectors of tourism and maritime industry, nothing wrong with that, but when you put yourself in our shoes, one has to consider what will be important to the two business communities, not today, but in 10 years from now. And I think that I would like to make a point to the startup community that was mentioned earlier, to the technological innovation that is behind every sector that we do business in, including the agricultural one, uh, and also to consider the AI, the artificial intelligence implications in just about every sector of our uh, uh, daily uh, routine. Uh, the future is holding for all of us uh, an opportunity in capital intensive industries, in technological intensive industries, and I think that the labor of the future will be a little different than what the labor is today. So having said all of what I said, it is truly important to see the Academia of Greece and the Academia of India, the new young scientists of the two countries work together in a way that will be prosperous to both. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Rajiv, you talked about the fact that India is still a per capita-wise poor country. But what is fascinating is the way India has used technology to mainstream our various communities. So for some of you may know, but uh, over 500 million Indians have joined the financial mainstream. They have got a digital bank account in just five years. 500 million people is more than the population of Western Europe and North America combined. No other country in the world or no other democracy in the world has ever managed this. Even in the, in the field of uh, logistics, there's a uni unified logistics interface platform which is bringing all port and logistics operations with common data sharing. We have famously very siloed government uh, structures, but the ministries are now sharing data over many of these uh, 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 new platforms which have been created. A quick point from you, Rajiv, on the importance of digital public infrastructure and its role in bringing the masses into the economic mainstream. Yeah, thank you. You you said quite a lot about it, but uh, let me expand if I if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman. So uh, India has a population today of over 1.4 billion people, and out of that 1.4 billion people, or more than 1.4, 97 or 98 percent have a digital biometric ID. All right. It is the largest biometric system in the world by far, right? And it is something truly remarkable. Now, based on that, what has been rolled out? One of the early things which was rolled out was giving people bank accounts. So over 500 families. Million. 500, sorry, 500 million families, thank you. <laughs> In, in India, you know, unfortunately, the unit is a million. <laughs> so, you know, That's the default setting. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pranjal. So over 500 million bank accounts have been opened in pretty record time. And it is through this that inclusiveness and including the poor people comes in. So in the early days, you know, there was a system of having to deliver physical rice and wheat and lentils. Today, all they do is they transfer the money and the person can go and buy the rations. So there's a zero wastage of money 
and it happens instantly. And no corruption. I mean, there used to be a problem that money would never reach the people, but with a direct linkage yeah. to your mobile wallet, it's there. And so this is in terms of the how do we include or how do we improve the, the, the weaker sections of society. Similarly, <coughs> for cooking gas, you know, which is a, it's an expensive thing, cooking gas for people who are living on two, three dollars a day. Now, cooking gas is given to them free, one cylinder per family per month. And again, this is done through a digital transfer of money. So, you know, there's things are being used very effectively. One of the new things are for the hundred most or the hundred poorest million, I should say millions of families, there is now a free insurance policy for medical insurance, right? So these are big numbers and the government is trying to focus also on the, the bottom of the pyramid to try and get them into the mainstream society. And they're succeeding. Uh, in the last 10 years, about 140 million people have come out of the poverty into people who can participate in education, in eating, have a roof uh, under the, on top of their heads because the government has a plan. And I forget the figures, but I think in the urban areas, uh, is it about 10 million new houses have been given? And in the rural areas, 22 million houses have been given to people, right? On very soft loans. So there's no uh, margin money or seed capital, but they give it. So this is how India and the Indian government has been tackling uh, getting the poor people out into the main stream of life using this digital Aadhaar platform. It's called uh, today uh, India's digital stack. Digital and, public infrastructure. Yeah, digital stack. And it's the digital infrastructure. Today, I mean, if one walks into the airport, you can register yourself on, on your biometrics, on your Aadhaar card. And if you register it, you can just walk in. You know, there's no security, etc. Other than baggage screening, that's mandatory for everybody. But in terms of entry, in terms of security, so all these things have led also to what you said, Mr. Minister, startups. It's this digital stack, it's this basic infrastructure of having 1.4 million people, 1.4 billion people uh, on this uh, biometric network. So with their permissions, which are fairly easily granted, you can do many things, including a KYC. Sure. So thanks, Rajiv. I think he will have a lot of questions from all of you when you meet him later. Uh, he'll be able to answer about various other uh, uh, initiatives which are there. But uh, since I want to take some questions from all of you, I'm going to take a quick uh, uh, intervention from Foycon and from Vineet before I come to you. Uh, you. You talked about Cyprus and you talked about Greece. Are there specific sectors that the Greek industry is keen to work with India or do you think they want to explore everything? Foycon. Uh, definitely there are specific sectors of the, uh, of the Greek economy that work already quite close with India, like the pharma yes. uh, uh, sector. Um, Greece has uh, developed a quite important uh, pharma business. Uh, it produces 10% of the uh, production of um, uh, drugs consumed in the European Union. And obviously, a lot of the raw material is coming out of uh, India. However, there is an issue of awareness. I mentioned before uh, the fact that Greece or uh, Cyprus can be a gateway for Indian companies. How many Indian corporates are aware about that? True. Uh, how many Greek companies know what are the advantages of working together with Indian companies? So there is an issue of awareness. We have to work on that and conferences like the one that we have today and tomorrow are helping in this direction. Uh, this is the reason why uh, Eurobank, as I said, is teaming up with all the major Indian chambers so that to promote 
this idea and contribute to a better awareness between the two countries. That's a brilliant point. Uh, I think there has to be, you know, it's good to have a high-level conversation, but we have to make sure that Indians know about these opportunities in Greece. Otherwise, sometimes it gets lost in the overall EU framework. Uh, and, uh, of course, Greece, and I would really say that uh, with, with your leadership uh, and with minister's leadership, uh, more Greek entrepreneurs should come to India and see for yourself so that, you know, people don't ask, uh, uh, you know, are uh, visitors here saying that you have good roads in India or not. You have to come there and see it uh, yourself. We need quickly uh, one minute or two minutes of your thoughts on geopolitics. Uh, India and uh, Greece are the cradles of democracy and the largest democracy in the world. Uh, I mean, either ways. And I think uh, we are natural allies into a lot of things. We know that geopolitics has shifted from land to sea now. We know that geopolitics has shifted from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indo-Pacific Ocean now. Uh, this means that these corridors that we've just talked about, this means that the cooperation that uh, both our countries need to have uh, is just immense. It's, it's, it's essential to counter uh, counter a world, counter to be in a world where we are safe. So the, the, the ministers that have met, the prime ministers that have met are really aligned towards those goals. And uh, the support of each other, I think, you know, India's entry into uh, Europe through Greece and uh, Greece using India as a stable economic partner will definitely help each other. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we have some mics in the audience, please? May I request the organizers to have the mics here? Uh, I'd request uh, all of you to share your thoughts and questions if you have any uh, for the panel. Please raise your hands and do introduce yourself. Sir, may, I, may we have a mic for him, please? Thank you, Pranjal. Uh, my name is Shishir Priyadarshi. I'm uh, advisor to the Adani Group's chairman on international relations. I'm also setting up a think tank for, for the group. Uh, we've been doing some work on the IMEC corridor, which incidentally has been mentioned by any, everyone. <clears throat> Just sharing a thought is that, you know, it's not the first corridor. It's not going to be the last corridor. What would be really important, and I, and I throw this more as, uh, you know, for everyone's consumption, is if the corridor is as important as we talk about it today, 10 years from now, which means we've got to be different from a number of corridors that already exist. And there was something that uh, Rajiv Ji, you mentioned about ensuring that these corridors are just not transport corridors. They've got to be much more, you've got to ensure that they are complete centers of economic development. And if you take just one aspect of those corridors, the ports, and you know, we've heard the Greek ports about them too. You develop it as a port, you develop it as a, probably a special economic zone, you develop it as renewable energy production, you develop it as a data center, so it's really the entire gamut. So any thoughts on this, especially in the context of Greek ports, would be very and very I, useful. I should just add that the Adani Group, uh, which is well known here, is, is uh, also running India's first transshipment port, which was just opened uh, a few uh, weeks ago. And uh, it is using the latest technology to be able to uh, bring freight costs uh, to the lowest level. But Perhaps, Minister, may I request you for your thought first? Well, my initial thought, well, first of all, I, I do comprehend completely the question, and I would say that this is going to be a corridor of values more than a corridor of replicating what other corridors do. There are indeed many corridors in the region, but in the region there are many tough neighborhoods. So at the moment in time that there is toughness in the Eastern European part and in the Gulf and the Middle East and in Africa and other parts of the world, 
countries that share the same value set get along one next to the other, not only to uh, strategically work together, but also to develop economically, as you said. Uh, there are a couple of things that make this corridor, this connection between Greece and India very special. It's not only the historical connection, it's not only the cultural connection, but it's also the economic development. India, the country of 1.4 billion, the country of very high technology and excellent roads, uh, is the place that brings birth to billions of products that are being produced for the markets of the world and in particular the markets of Europe. So from a logistic perspective, it makes full sense that the container ship that brings products from the world factory of India to the European continent will eventually cross the Suez Canal and reach out to Greece before it ends up to Italy, Spain, or Rotterdam, or Hamburg in Germany. Having said that, I need to stress out the particular circumstances of the Houthis aggression to the maritime industry in the Red Sea that makes things a bit more complicated. And as I said, it's a tough neighborhood earlier. So most of the vessels go through the Africa continent and through the Gibraltar uh, Canal. So it, it has an impact to the cost, to the transportation elements, to the logistical sense, but does not contradict to the essence of Greece and India being together from a logistical perspective. The ports is truly important, so we welcome the Indian connection to the ports of the country, and also the energy sector and the data connection is very important. Uh, the data centers, the data transmission becomes more and more important and requires uh, cables and satellite connections that will make it easier and faster to grow. So having said that, <coughs> the energy sector is very important. Greece is a hub for LNG liquefied natural gas through a number of ways. I do not wish to take any more of your time to explain the floating storage and reclassification units and the vertical corridors and the TAP and other ways that Greece provides natural gas to its partners in Europe and it becomes a hub for that purpose but also it becomes a hub for electrical power from North Africa to Greece and from Greece to the rest of the European continent. So abundant of opportunities uh, and I hope that we will soon see the business sector of Greece and the business community of India working jointly together to take advantage of it. Thank you, Minister. And I think you referred already to scientists and innovators and startups connecting. Sir, you have a question. May I have the mic here, please? Uh, kindly introduce yourself. Hello, thank you very much for so interesting information that we are learning today. I am Professor George Tselakis from Technical University of Crete. Uh, this IMA corridor is a very important corridor for many reasons, but we have to take in consideration that uh, in the last two decades, there are some countries that they have as a strategy to reveal some old glory, some countries that they have empires in the past, and they are interesting now to get influence in the previous territories that they used to have when they were an empire. And we speak about Turkey, about Iran. So we see that Iran through Houthi, they have great problems in the supply chain. So this is uh, an issue that uh, we have to see uh, very carefully because even we make other corridors, the problems in the area is going 
to exist right. and maybe become much uh, difficult in the future. But the IME corridor is very, very important to be done. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing that thought. I think you've underlined a very important risk that we have to factor in. Uh, I saw another hand. Uh, yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, my name is Tarun Anand. I represent Universal AI University in India. So we talked about various areas. Uh, we have a huge population, 1.4 billion, which was referred to. Can Greece become a gateway to that talent to come to India, uh, to come to Europe? Because Europeans uh, have obviously evolved and they have a higher standard of living. There are lots of jobs which possibly Indians can come and do in the European world. So do you envisage that uh, Greece could become a gateway into Europe for the talent of India? Minister, you, and then I can request for Khan to answer. Very quickly, uh, as I said earlier, the labor of the future is not exactly the labor of the past. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, Europe needs working hands, and so does Greece, and we have an agreement in place in as far as uh, allowing uh, immigration from India to Greece. But the truth of the matter, and if you look into the future, the labor, and especially when it comes to talent and technical talent, does not necessarily require an Indian to move to Greece or a Greek to move to India. So it is impo very important to me that we bring the two communities together, as I said earlier, academia and scientists, young people who can work together even from a distance. But I completely understand what you're saying, and I do agree with you. We have it within our portfolio of the next pending matters to conclude. Thank you, Minister. And there are actually very interesting examples in the European Union, like Estonia has an e-citizen uh, digital residency program as well, which is also allowing a lot of uh, uh, people from other parts of the world to operate from Europe, but not being necessarily physically exactly. there. Exactly. Thank you, Minister. Welcome. A quick thought from you on this. Yeah. Um, uh, nowadays, Greece, and I would say Europe overall, uh, is an area that needs uh, labor and talent. There is, uh, for demographic reasons, there is not enough um, in, in Greece and in, in Europe overall. So, talent coming out of uh, India uh, is more than welcome, uh, especially in areas like technology, uh, we need this talent. Um, Eurobank has taken the initiative to sign an MOU with NPCI uh, about enabling UPI in, in Greece. Mm -hmm. So Indians who work um, in Greece could send remittances directly uh, to their wallets uh, back um, uh, in India. I think this, this is going to facilitate um, the transfer uh, of, of people. But given that we are coming from, from academia, there is a new legislation in, in Greece that allows uh, uh, foreign universities to establish a permanent presence in, uh, in Greece, operate in Greece, and uh, facilitate through that the transfer of talent from one country to another. That's a great answer. Tarun, you should consider a, a, a campus in, uh, in Greece. Uh, we have time for one last question before we end. Anybody else? Uh, who has a thought? Right, so I'm going to close uh, this session uh, by, by uh, not trying to summarize because there is a lot to, for us to digest, but I think one of the key points that I would like to share with you from what the eminent speakers here shared, one is awareness. I think there is, as, as you very rightly said, there is a tremendous need to have more connections, more conversations uh, between various stakeholders in Greece and in India. So every dimension. And the second point, what the minister said, is that we have to bring every category of our society and economy to connect with each other. And of course, if uh, we have better flights, uh, we have better connectivity, both uh, digital as well as physical, I'm sure uh, this inflection point of India and Greece blossoming together, as you said, Rajiv, uh, would be a reality. 
With this, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and this is the end of the plenary session. But please join me in thanking the speakers for their contribution.